Welcome again to the Life Changing Questions podcast. And today we have someone who's been on the show before. Uh, back in episode 16, we had such a wonderful, uh, wonderful session with Hank van der Merwe. And Hank is the co founder of Think, Feel, Do, and is an internationally recognized expert on the subjects of business leadership and self mastery. He combines his 20 plus years of executive corporate experience in the ICT industry with his energetic and entertaining facilitation style, making one of the highest rated consultants uh, in the field internationally. Hank has inspired his clients in over 25 different countries, and he's been endorsed by uh, industry leaders such as Ken Blanchard, uh, who you would know would be the author of the best-selling book, One Minute Manager, Fons Tropinars, the culture guru, and the emotional intelligence pioneer, Martin Newman. So, Hank, welcome back. Great to have you again. Evan, thank you so much. It's great to see you again. Hey, I'd, uh, I, I've been so excited to speak to you. I know in the last episode, you spoke a lot about um, finding your purpose as a leader and why it was important to find your purpose as a leader. Right. And today I want to jump straight into you and your purpose, because I know since we spoke last, your your purpose has taken on a whole new uh, level of energy, a whole new focus. And I'd really love for you to share a little bit about what you've been doing, because I know it's going to be so valuable for our, uh, our listeners to hear about your journey. And they're going to pick up some great lessons uh, from, from what's happening for you. So please, please let us know uh, what have you been up to. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. So the purpose itself, uh, the statement hasn't changed. My statement always been, uh, my purpose is to live an extraordinary life and to help other people to do the same. And what I've done is uh, really focused on, on resilience. In fact, teenage resilience is where I'm focusing a lot of my energy at the moment because I have teenagers. And, you know, when, when you have a teenager and suddenly you have to start dealing with all of this stuff and you start, uh, you know, becoming aware of what's going on in the world in terms of, um, you know, the emotional well-being, the physical well-being, the mental well-being. And it was a simple transition. What we do in the corporate world is absolutely applicable to, to teenagers. So I've literally transitioned the business and doing a lot of work in the schools area. Uh, we've been working with, with a load of schools uh, in those areas, uh, particularly around emotional intelligence. And we've also relocated. We've moved to the Gold Coast. Um, so relocated to somewhere close to the sea. So, you know, for the lifestyle. Uh, and that's basically it. So still doing a lot of work uh, with, with corporates. Um, obviously, when, when COVID hit, we couldn't go anywhere. In fact, I have not been on an airplane in two years internationally. I was on the last plane that landed from Cape Town, uh, I think it was back in 2020, and immediately after that plane, the borders came down. So uh, it's, it's been a blessing, and yeah, it's been a blessing, I think, because I've, I've been able to spend a lot of time observing the kids, you know, being with the kids, I've not been traveling. And yeah, so that's what, what I've been up to. I've been working in the schools area, um, still doing the corporate stuff, but really, really passionate about teenagers uh, based on what's going on in the world with their mental well-being and their emotional well-being and their physical well-being. Well, and, and tell us a little bit more about that, because I know some of our listeners will have teenage kids or may yeah. uh, be at a point where they know teenage kids. And when you say what's going on in the world, I, I know there's some pretty scary statistics about what's happening for that demographic of, uh, you know, of our society. So I wonder if you could share with us what's going on and, and what you're doing about it. OK, so let's start with corporate for an example. And when I'm teaching corporate resilience, there are a few things that I'm teaching. And the first thing is, and, and my, my take on it, and obviously it's been corroborated with people like Franz Trompenaz and Martin Newman and you know, the work I did with Ken Blanchard. Um, any organization that wants to be resilient, an organization that wants to be resilient needs to understand who they are, right? what, their, you know, what their purpose is, and what, what their why is. And I know Simon Sinek made this famous, start with why. But any organization that wants to you know, make it through this current stage of our, our crazy existence is they, they need to have an identity. They need to know who they are. And that was the first step. The second step was for them to align all of the activities of that organization around that singular purpose. The third step would be to build capability in all the areas that they've identified so that they could align to the overall purpose. And then the fourth step was about uh, those, those tough conversations that we have to keep ourselves you know, in check. And I literally looked at that model and thought, hey, this is absolutely applicable to teenagers. Step one, what is your direction, right? What is your why? But not the overall why in your entire life, but rather just what is your why as a teenager? You know, these, these teenagers are so bombarded with stimulus and, and information and distractions. To ask somebody, what do you want to be, you know, when you grow up and when you're 25, 26, 27, they have no clue. 
a lot of them. What they do know is they do know a very short period of time just in front of them. So I did the same thing. What is the direction that you want to achieve in your life? Where do you want to go for your teenage life? The second part was about aligning their activities. So in corporates, how do we do that? Well, we align activities through values. We align activities through good old fashioned job descriptions, through purpose of role, you know, through all the organizational development stuff. And I did the same thing with the teenagers to say, how do we align your activity? I know what we do. Let's take your purpose. Let's figure out some outcomes for you in all of the areas of your life. And once we figured out the outcome in all those areas of your life, let's set some goals. So we align your activity through goal setting to your purpose. The third area was about building capability. In the corporate, what am I doing? I'm teaching leadership. I'm teaching conflict management. I'm teaching culture, um, emotional intelligence, uh, disc profiling, all of those wonderful things. So how do we do that for teenagers? Same thing. We say, okay, what are the things that are going to build your capability to allow you to continue along the path that you've now aligned through your goal setting towards your purpose. So everything, you know, feeds on everything. And in that, you know, in that section, what I did was I talked about belief systems, I talked about needs, um, you know, the work that Tony and, and Chloe Madonna's did around needs is, is absolutely fantastic. And it just explains so much, you know, when, when you think about, and, and we'll get into more of that later, but when you think about human needs and, and understanding what a, you know, what a teenager's trying to achieve when, when they get that level of awareness, you know, when they get that level of pattern recognition, then they can, they can control, right? Then they can self-regulate. So in that section, I spoke about belief systems. I spoke about needs. I speak about body language, uh, meditation. Now I know meditation has been thrown around like confetti at the moment. Everybody's saying, be mindful, be, you know, meditate, but not many people can, can actually take that, you know, further. I can because we've got an emotional intelligence assessment for children. I've got one. And I can actually assess a child's emotional intelligence. All right. Then I can give them very real scientific uh, next steps. Okay. So we build that capability and we teach them about mindfulness. We teach them about uh, meditation, about visualization. And so that's the third section, exactly like we did it in the corporate. Then we go to the last section, and that's about the people in your life that are going to have those challenging conversations with you, those character building conversations. In a corporate, it's about giving feedback. It's about setting clear work direction. It would be about, um, you know, understanding the purpose of your role and how you fit into that. You know, how does your why, your personal why fit into your professional why? But with teenagers, it was about who are the role models in your life? Who do you look up to? Uh, who are your mentors? Who are your coaches? Who are your accountability partners? And then to finish it off and say, okay, well, let's go make a promise to ourselves. And then we come up with a credo. And this credo, and I was told by a good friend of mine, uh, Sean Thompson, uh, an international surfer, amazing author. He's just uh, released a book called Surfer and the Sage. Um, he said to me, I spoke to him yesterday. I happened to be sitting at Burley Lifesaver Club looking at the beautiful waves. And, and he said to me, yeah, credo actually means a promise, right? So what is your promise to yourself? And then I get the kids to do a promise to, the, uh, to themselves. And I just got the book here. And what they say is, all I ask them to do is a statement. So I say, I am, and they put in a statement. I love, put in a statement. I can, I will, I choose, and I have. And then they add it all up and they say, the future I see, dot, dot, dot. All right, and then they fill it up. So they make a promise to themselves. Exactly what we do in corporates. And now I'm taking... 15, 20 years worth of corporate experience, all the stuff that I've studied for adults. And I'm saying to the kids, hey, let me help you and let me get you on the right path now uh, so that we don't have to have any more tragedies because we've got far too many kids who are uh, lost, uh, who are checking out, who are um, hurting themselves, right? Whether it's cutting, whether it's suicide, whether it's depression, there's too much going on, Kevin. And I know I'm just one man, but... With a match, we can start a fire. And that's why, you know, I'm so pleased to know people like yourself, because uh, you share my passion with helping people be, be the best versions that they can be. Oh, yes. And if we can uh, help some help have some gasoline to that match, then let's, let's do it. Because <laughs> Thank you. I, I think the, the, the point that you're making is, is a really uh, important one, because I think I read uh, on in, in the book there or the link that you shared that uh, suicide is the leading cause of death for yeah, children or not children for people of the ages of 15 to 24 
right? And to let that sink in, that's that's pretty crazy. Suicide is the leading is. cause of death amongst age range. And uh, even still, the, the point you were making about people um, you know, of that age group cussing themselves or something, they say that one in four uh, people, adolescents, have some kind of mental health uh, situation going on as well. So yeah. what you're creating here and um, you know, helping, helping that age group to understand is critical. And I'd imagine... Uh, those people now in corporate in their 30s, 40s, 50s, if they had this kind of teaching and this kind of lesson when they were in their teenage years, uh, it would make a major difference for the rest of their life. So I think it's, it's super important. Tell us a little bit more about the, the, uh, the, the, the real spark of this for you, because I know uh, uh, in your book, you share a, a really um, touching story around Simon. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about Simon. Okay. So I just got chills as you talk about Simon. Um, Let's see if I can get through this. So we were born and raised in, in, in South Africa. And South Africa obviously has a, um, you know, a massive have and have not situation, right? There's big disparity. And some people live in absolute poverty. And I'm talking about such poverty that um, you would be horrified. Um, and we were sitting around our table, our Christmas table, and my wife cooks really, really well. And she just loves entertaining. And we had this massive spread and we had bottles of wine and all my friends around. And it was just, we just looked at them, how much luckier can we get? And it was really interesting for me because a lot of my friends were moaning about the state of affairs in the country. And I was going, well, okay, stop moaning, do something. I'm a man of action. Let's not talk about it. Let's do something. And they said, well, what can we do? We're just one person. And I said, no, why don't each one reach one or each one teach one? If there's something that's in your genius zone, reach out, help somebody else, because you never know what that one act of kindness could be or could do. And they say, okay, cool. So what are you going to do? I said, well, what do I know? Personal development, right? That's what I do, leadership development. So I wrote the first version of Yes, I Can. And we were supposed to be at a school in a really underprivileged area called Deep Sluit, which means deep ditch. And it's an area where there's something like 140,000 people crammed in to a relatively small area and the people are living on top of each other there's no running water there's no sewage it's just you know you look at that and, and you just say how you know how do these people live like this um, and your heart just breaks and you try and do whatever you can so I said I'm going to come and teach you about leadership and you know we found out later that the headmistress said to me that there are no role models in this area or not enough role models in this in this area so we were supposed to be at the school on a Monday and due to some logistical issues we didn't get there until the Wednesday. When we got there, um, it was interesting because we had to drive in and people were like, oh, what are you guys doing in here? And so we got to the school, through the gate, closed the gate, fence, you know, put the chain on so we're safe. And um, the school was somber, man. Everybody was just really somber and irritated. People were irritated, people crying. And I was going, oh, what have I done? Like, what's happened? So I said to the headmistress, what's going on? She said, don't worry about it. Just come and do your thing and go. And I was like, what? what's that about? You know, I'm here giving you my time. And she said, look at this wall. And on the wall were pictures of like some of the banks that have come through and, and, you know, local businesses. And she says, you're all the same. You just come here, you get your photograph with the kids, you give them a t-shirt and a Coke, and then you go. All right. So I said, that's not me. She says, I've heard it all before. So I said, wow, okay. What a welcome. And I got up and I did the session and I could just feel the energy shift. Man, the energy just shifted and they got the message. And, you know, I'm just the channel and you, and you know this, we're just the medium, right? This, this, this work is coming through us. And, and as I did, and this crowd just lit up and they started singing and, and, you know, going crazy. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Headmistress is at the back and she's crying. So I get off and she calls me over and she says, I need to tell you something. So I said, what's that? And she said, um, there was a little boy named Simon and he killed himself yesterday. If you had been here on Monday, he'd still be alive. And I was like, oh, like how do you own that? How do you deal with that? Whether that was fair or not, it is what it is. And that has inspired me. And even today, when I go to schools and say, hey, we want to talk about resilience and, you know, oh, we're too busy. I remember Simon because somewhere there's a Simon. And I have no doubt that if Simon had heard that message, he, he would be here today. So, so that's the story. That's how we started this whole thing. Um, yeah, and it was wow. due to tragedy. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think it's a yeah a great way to to give meaning to Simon and you know his life and and what what's happened there and the fact that you're bringing this now to uh, to help other people because like you say there are other Simons. I know I've got uh, clients and colleagues I've spoken with and their children are going through similar situations and they're doing their best but they don't really know uh how, how how do we help them through this i mean it's not particularly easy to to relate so if there's someone listening who knows someone like this uh who's going through some mentally uh mental tough situations or challenges what's what's the best thing they can do how how can we help them right now just based on okay. something they're listening to right now what, what can they do right away so first of all there's there's degrees of of seriousness if you know somebody who you know, is battling and they, um, you know, and there's something that you want to do, by all means, put them into the, buy the book, all right? Uh, my book is broken down into, uh, into those five sections. And I actually teach people how to be resilient before you need to be resilient. Because I think that's the trick. What's the point in learning how to be resilient afterwards, right? Rather, let's become the kind of person who will be resilient, no matter what the situation is that, that um, you know, gets thrown at them. So, if it's just generally, let's help our, our teenagers find a direction for their lives, uh, come up with some strategies to achieve whatever that direction is, things that they're going to use the rest of their life, feel free to contact me. And, and I'll, I'll give you the, the, uh, you know, the contact details later. If there's somebody who you, are, who you think is at risk, you, have, you must, as an, and, and you know, South Africans, we like to say must, all right? <laughs> you must absolutely do something about it and whether that's um you know get the child professional help or alert the teachers or alert one of those uh, suicide hotlines like beyond blue and you know those type of things that you've got to do that so um we we can't you know we can't just ignore it because so many times i'm hearing from parents saying if only we had seen the signs and then afterwards the signs are obvious but during it, everybody's, you know, involved in their own thing. And I saw a quote the other day that said, your, your biggest achievement is right in front of you, right? Meaning your children. And th that's absolutely the case. Spend time with your kids. Don't outsource your affection to them. Uh, get them off their devices at dinner, right? Get them off their devices at dinner. Here's the thing. We cannot get rid of the digital world. It's not going to happen. In fact, it's accelerating. And, and you know, the last time we spoke, we were talking about my book, Live on Purpose. And I said there were five game changers. Those five game changers, I was spot on. Whatever I said in, in, in that previous intro, I was spot on with those five game changers. And then add COVID. Oh, my goodness. So advice to parents that are listening to it is number one is be there for your kids be present you are your child's first or you whether they're your child or you're a caregiver you are their first um example be the example get off your phone go for a walk be physically active we know that that there's a direct link between what you think what you feel and what you do so control your thinking and help them have better quality decisions that will help control what they're feeling which will control what they're doing so as parents don't outsource get involved now i know the kids are going to roll their eyes and they're going to huff and puff but just be there for them i did this program with my son jared uh, Jared is 15 years old. He's one meter 96 and climbing, right? Um, he's, a, he's an absolute uh, unit. And, and even with my daughter, who's, who's 11 years old, I have to tell you, I think I met him for the first time when we did this program, because I wasn't in that, do what I tell you, because I'm your father. I was in the, so tell me what your values are and tell me what behaviors come with these values and tell me what your needs are, right? So, you know, he came out, his top need was certainty. We moved a lot since we got to the Gold Coast. What does that mean? That means his need for certainty was not being met in any way. So, you know, I looked at him for the first time and I thought, hey, okay, I get it. Uh, we spoke about values. His number one value is, is honesty. And bless him, to his detriment, he is honest. So when his sister <laughs> asks him a question, he just tells the truth. What do you think of my drawing? Oh, it's terrible. Right? It's not terrible. She's an amazing drawer, but you know what teenage boys are like. And you know, I looked at him and I said, okay, what is your second value? He goes, happiness. I said, mm, can you see how your first and second value are, are you know, contradicting each other? One, you want to be brutally honest, but number two, you want to be happy. And, and when you're honest, some not is not happy. So can you consider somebody else's well, well-being? And he said, yeah, that's empathy, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. It's empathy. So you know, it's one thing to talk about empathy. I can measure it. 
I can measure how much empathy you have with, with this emotional intelligence assessment that we, that we do. Uh, one school in particular has done a couple of hundred um, assessments and they completely understand the emotional intelligence quotient of, of their students. So what can we do? As I said, let me repeat, be there for the kid. Communicate with them, talk to them, not at them. Um, spend quality time together, sit around the dinner table, find out how their day was. Don't let them get distracted with Netflix and with YouTube and um, you know, all of that kind of stuff, um, you know, and, and devices. I'm not saying take the device away. I'm, you can't. It's, it's, it'll never happen. Um, you know, they'll find a way. But, you know, find a way to integrate it and spend time as a family. If you need to and if you want a blueprint, then by all means, contact me. And, you know, the book is available. It's available online. Plus, to make it even better, because I know some parents go, you know, I don't really have the skills to have this conversation with my child. No worries. I've actually done 45 minutes with the videos where I explain the concepts and I say, OK, stop, fill out the, you know, fill out the relevant section, then continue. Um, I've had teachers come to me and, and, and take on the, um, you know, take on the program and say, we're going to teach us in our schools and we're going to break it up over 12 weeks. You know, um, I do a workshop. I've actually got one coming up on, on, you know, next week where I get a bunch of kids and we actually do the program. We do a yes, I can uh, workshop, you know, three and a half, four hours, we get it done. Um, so what I'm saying to parents and to adults and to caregivers is we have the tools. We've learned the lessons. We know what works. All right. Come with us. Let's, let's do this together. You're not alone. So that would be my message to, to parents. Beautiful message. You're not alone. There's support there and it's available. And just to, uh, to echo what uh, Hank said around that, if you're a child or anyone you know is feeling uh, at the extreme end and they're suicidal, then you know, for your country, check out what is the suicide hotline number. There's a lot of uh, support available. It's free. It's available. And here in Australia, suicideline.org.au is helpful. If your kids uh, need help, you can just call 1800 55 1800. So I think that's super important, that message. But uh, as you said, Hank, it's sometimes this is really about, um, you know, helping make sure that the, you know, our, our children are on purpose. They have a very clear vision of what they want and they know yeah. their, their values and their needs and how best to, to meet them. And I've, yeah. I've just gone through, you very kindly shared uh, the, the amazing uh, videos that you put together and I've just gone through them and you've done a really fantastic job in there. It's, uh, it's so Thank clear, you. so easy to, to follow. All your decades of experience uh, in speaking really, really shines through. It's just uh, <laughs> Thank so, you. so clear, so uh, to the point. And, you know, the, the templates to fill out, make it, uh, make it super easy for anyone to do that as well. So uh, I, I really love what you shared here. And I think it's important, not just for uh, our children, but I think there's lessons in this, of course, for us as business owners and business leaders. Yes. And, you know, if we were to, to take some of these lessons uh, for the business owners and business leaders, and you said about being learning resilience before you need to be resilient, what, what yes. are some of the things that we should be thinking about as business owners? How can we be more resilient ourselves? Because as you said, we've, we've come for a turbulent two years and who knows yep. what else is to follow. There's ups and downs oh, in any industry, any time. So uh, what, what else do we need to be doing now to prepare ourselves for anything else that's to come? It goes back to the first book that I wrote when I said live on purpose. You have to understand your why. You know, Mark Twain said the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. So, you know, what, what is a business? It's, it's a group of people who get together and, and who have a purpose. So whatever we, we do in our personal lives should be mimicked in, in our corporate lives. But what we tend to do is we do the corporate life and we have a mission, vision, values and a strategic direction and we build organizational health and we worry about those things. But we don't worry about the, you know, the individual elements that go into that. So as business owners, you first need to be resilient and then be with other resilient people who are united by a purpose to do good in the world, right? Purpose more than profit. And, and that way is how businesses can be, uh, you know, can be resilient. And I got to tell you, I was a little bit sneaky because I've had feedback from some parents to say, you know, I'm sitting with my kid going through this program and a lot of these things, surprisingly, a lot of these things were relevant to me. And I said, you yeah, think, right? And what I'm actually, what I've actually done is because of the way that I'm teaching it, I've said to parents, okay, you're safe. You don't have to come up with this. I'll do it. Watch the video. Then they're answering the questions and they're coming back. Saying, I really thought about that question about what extraordinary means. And it's really interesting. And so, you know, it, I'm killing two birds with one stone or I'm not killing two birds. Then I'm freeing two birds with one, you know, one movement there. <laughs> Um, so business owners, you need to be resilient because your kids are watching you. You're teaching them how to behave. 
And when you come home stressed and when you come home and it's just work, 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 um, we're not great examples to the next generation because you know, we burn out and, um, you know, we need to move. I, I, I looked at a stat the other day that said that, you know, something some ridiculous percentage of, um, of Australians are sedentary. I think it was 60 or 70 percent of Australians are sedentary. And looking at those figures, there was one stat that caught my eye that that a kid from the 1980s who runs 1.6 kilometers against a child from 2015 would would be like three or four hundred meters ahead of the kid right that, that would be the difference 300 meters and that's just the difference in lung capacity and physical you know um, ability so as a nation and as a you know in the world we're moving moving you know less and less and less and less so my my example to to businesses is get moving people don't sit down have stand up meetings right get those stand up desks get get moving because you can't think greater than you're feeling best way to change what you're feeling is to change what you're doing so incorporate those well being programs there's lovely well being programs out there but get moving right get moving um, have stand up meetings don't sit the chairs become the new smoking this thing will kill you right? it will absolutely kill you so corporates know your why know the why of your organization hire people who believe what you believe and then teach them what you know but train them and give them the opportunity to express themselves whatever that is and, and like i say to the kids you don't have to be the best in the world but you do have to be the best in your world and it was quite interesting i had a parent saying yeah but you're really driving the success um mantra uh, you know, and I, I say, okay, well, let's test the theory. And, and I had a $5 note and a $100 note. And I say to the kids, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. Um, in this hand, I have nothing. And in this hand, I have $5. Which hand do you want? And what do they all do? I want the five bucks. So, okay, take you one step further. Here's the five, here's a hundred. Which one do you want? What do you think they do? Do they say five? No, I hope not. they want a hundred. <laughs> Right. I said, okay, you want 100. All right. Um, why is that? Because we want more. I said, ah, so you want success. And they go, ah, oh, yeah. All right. I said, so don't tell me that you don't want to be successful because you do. If you had a choice of one hour of leisure time or two hours of leisure time, what will you take? I'll take two. All right. So, so if you, you know, so we, we built to grow, we built to contribute. You know what I'm talking about here. That's our highest calling, you know, built to, to grow and contribute. Give them that opportunity. Right, we've got to give them that opportunity. And, you know, as I said, the parents, business owners, take this book, read through it, and you'll go, is this a kid's book? It absolutely is. But there are lessons in here that are timeless, fundamental truths. And, um, yeah, it's not just for the kids. And if, if I can bring the family back together, whatever your family looks like, it doesn't matter, whatever it looks like, if we can bring that family unit back together and, and share stories with each other and do life together. I think we can be resilient as individuals and I know we can be resilient as adults and, I, and, and I'm convinced we can be resilient as companies and as a country. I love that. Absolutely beautiful and very important message. And on the whole uh, conversation around success, one thing I noticed in your uh, program as I went through them, it's really about how do we define success? I see a lot of business owners get this wired up. Sometimes they think success is you know, chasing the most revenue they can or, uh, you know, having the biggest team that they can. Um, but actually, does that really bring them the fulfillment and the happiness that they want? Going back to your point around values, you know, is that what they value? Maybe their success isn't to have the biggest revenue or the biggest team. Maybe their success is to be, you know, a one person business who actually uh, gets the flexibility and the time freedom in their life and actually has a higher margin. So what is success for you? And I think getting really clear on that and defining that becomes, becomes the important piece because if you're driving to accomplish some vision of success that isn't yours, you're never truly going to be fulfilled anyway. No. And I think you know that, um, I know what you're talking about here. So that's the difference between the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Um, and I found so many adults are, you know, burn, burn, burn and, you know, they the what do we say? We we give up our health to build our wealth, and then we spend our wealth to get our health back. And immune systems have taken an absolute hammering over the past two years. And people have got to look after themselves. They literally have, you've got to put yourself first. You have to prioritize what's most important. And that's why even even well with with the adults, I talk about three spheres of your life: your personal, professional, and your spiritual. Right. And I said, your personal sphere is about your mental, your emotional, and your physical. Your professional sphere for an adult is about your job, your career, and your wealth creation. 
uh, and for your spiritual sphere. And spiritual is not religion, but rather your morality, how you make decisions and your character. It's about connect, relate and contribute. So in the, in the school version, or the teenager version, the, you know, the personal and the spiritual were the same, but professional, I said, was only two things, which was about your school career, as well as your um, financial, because, you know, some children have uh, the opportunity to get some part-time work and, and, you know, what have you. Um, and you've got to look at all these. And what I'm trying to teach them now is that balance is important. Don't go over gradients because it'll pull the whole thing down, right? Rather be, you know, equal in all areas than through the roof on one to the detriment of the others. So I do a lot of cause and effect conversations, you know, with the kids to say, hey, you've got to understand, don't do what your parents did. Right. In terms of go, 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 you know, respect what they did, understand why they did it, especially if you're an immigrant, you know, the story we move from another country, we try as hard as we can to, you know, make a life for ourselves and, and um, I said, but you've got to have a distraction, and you've got to, you've got to be able to unwind um, and feed your brain, you know, get your kids off their devices just before bedtime, you know, they're completely stimulated. No wonder we having so much, you know, I can't sleep and ADD and get them off the you see anyone looking, get them off the sugar, right? Get them off the sugar. It's just crazy, the diets, you know, that, that our kids are on. So, you know, do the right thing. Do the right thing for yourself and for them. If you had a racehorse, you wouldn't feed them, you know, you wouldn't feed them fast food. You'd feed a racehorse what it needs to win. I love that. So true. And the whole uh, getting off a of sugar, easier said than done. I, I took on that oh. challenge myself and uh, it, it wasn't an easy journey, but hey, it, no. does make a, uh, it does make a massive difference on the other side. I think for me, I felt um, a big difference in the level of energy and emotions, yep. like the, the emotional yep. swings coming from the sugar, you know, the sugar burning high, low. It just, it's amazing what, what a difference that makes your emotions. So uh, uh, that may be a step too far for some people listening. And okay, I, I understand that completely, but uh, there's uh, certainly a lot of value in that. Absolutely gradual. And, and look, I'm not here to promote don't do sugar. I'm just saying be aware of it. And, you know, you underestimate what you can achieve in, in a couple of months, in a couple of years, and you overestimate what you can achieve in a few weeks. Um, what I did was I just started cutting sugar out. And well, first of all, I, I taught myself, well, where is the sugar? It's everywhere. Right. So pay attention to the good sugars and the bad sugars and, and see what's there. And say, so, OK, I, I cut it out of coffee. All right. And um, so now I don't have sugar in coffee at all. And the other day, I mistakenly put some sugar in a coffee, and I was like, oh, what the heck is going on here? And then I realized, oh, you threw it, because I had a guest who has sugar. Um, so I just did mine as well. Anyway, so but look, at the end of the day, we, we want to make better decisions. I think that's what this whole Yes, I Can is about. Make better decisions. Make informed decisions. Make better choices. Stop and think, right? What's good about the situation? How can I use this to my advantage? But if you don't have an overall purpose and an overall drive for your life, then it, it becomes very, you know, busy. Rather go, well, what is this in relation to where I'm going? And one of the things that I want to stress to everybody is, as adults, don't pass your measurement of success over to your kids. We tend to measure, um, you know, we have a starting point and then we go and then we look at where we are versus where we want to be. All right. And there's a gap. And then we look at ourselves and we go, oh, I'm depressed. I'm, you know, depressed, suppressed, oppressed, unimpressed because I'm not where I want to be. You know, we get angry because we want instant gratification. Flip it over and look backwards and go, how far have I come? How far have I come since I've started and celebrate that? And that's something that I do with the kids as well. I'm not turning them into little achievement junkies. What I am saying to them is, you know, we have one life. Well, let's do the best we can. Let's be a force for good. Let's step up and set a new standard. I love that. And I, it's something that I do on a daily basis. It's so easy uh, to discount or forget all the things that we've accomplished, all the things that we've done. And so you can get to the end of the day and you can feel tired, exhausted, whatever else, be focused on the things that didn't go well, you know, the client that, that wasn't happy or, you know, quit or something like that. Whereas actually, if you take the time every day to note down what are the three to five key things, uh, wins, things that have happened to move things forwards or we're good, you can always find three, three to five things every single day. Easy. doesn't matter how bad or challenging your day was. There's always several things that were, uh, were good in the day. I think if you do that on a daily basis, that really builds that, that great neural pathway. Now, I learned that from um, a psychologist from Harvard University. 
And she would do that. You're talking about getting the kids off the devices at dinner time. She would sit down at dinner time and ask them. And she would typically do this on a Friday, I think she said at the end of the week. And she would ask them, you know, what was great about the week? What were their wins for the week? And she said, it's not, it's not about that couple of moments where they're telling us that. It's like they have to be focused all week to notice the wins in order to then be able to tell us that on a Friday night. So it's setting their mind on the, the right thing. And I know you talk yes. about in your program around focus you know, and, and making sure you have the right focus and the right frame. That's one really powerful thing that we could begin to do. Let's start noticing the wins, getting, um, you know, ourselves and uh, our families, get them to share the wins, I think can be a really important uh, lesson. Absolutely. And it doesn't, you know, um, we've got this thing about participation, though, that participation is a win. And I said to my child, my son, I said, listen, your birth certificate gives you, is your participation certificate, right? That gives you the right to participate. Everything else you've got to earn. And, but having said that, I don't need you to win every race. There's, there's only one place on the top of the podium. I just need you to try your best. And, you know, maybe running is not for you. Maybe, you know, debating is your thing. And so whatever it is, just find it. Find your genius zone. You know, we've, we've measured success in the wrong way for far too long. And I think we've caused trouble with it. So, yeah. And, you know, once, you know, you know the saying, where focus goes, energy flows. And once, once kids start being aware of, I am enough, I'm good enough. And if I can, I'll just read you my daughter's credo. Um, and I looked at her and I said, how old are you again? She's 11. She said, uh, I am strong. I love myself as I am. And this is huge because she's 11 years old, pre-pubescent. Uh, and, you know, this is the time when young girls start to really become body aware. And, and but she said, I love myself as I am. And I can be anything I want to be. Uh, I will make good decisions. Uh, I choose to be positive. I have gifts and talents. And the future I see is up to me. Right. And I thought, Ooh. look at that. So now, <laughs> now I can say this behavior that's that's probably not resourceful. Is this taking you closer towards this purpose or further away from it? Um, and then just to say, hey, you know what? We make mistakes. You know, who, who, who hands up if you've never made a mistake? No hands, right? No hands. <laughs> no. Nah. Right. So you know, let's let's say you know it's part of learning. It's it's part of growing. But let's do it together. Um, and I'm just in awe. I sit and look at them and. I shake my head at some of the things that they come up with and I just go, wow, yeah, that's just incredible. And you see them coming into their own and their gifts and talents. And all I want them to do is, is be the best version of themselves and not necessarily what I think that should be because they're going to decide. And that's another thing for parents. Stop living your life through your kids. Right? It's their life. Just facilitate that they make the best decisions and they make you proud. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful message. Hank, I really appreciate you spending all the time and energy you have with us today. There's important lessons in here for us as business owners. There's important lessons here for, uh, for any of the parents listening. And uh, yeah, I really can't thank you enough. Hank, if people want to get in contact with you or, uh, or inquire about the amazing resources uh, that you've put together there, where, where would be the best place for them to do that? Okay, so first of all, you can uh, jump onto our website. Now, even though it's an Australian-centric website, we are based in Australia, this message is global. I've had people from Italy, um, I've had people from the UK, United States, uh, reaching out to me to say, this is timely. I was very fortunate uh, to have um, Dr. Martin Newman uh, endorse the book, and he said to me, he said, this is probably the clearest blueprint yet for overcoming indirection, procrastination, fear. He said, every student should be given the opportunity to do this. So I want to challenge everybody, all right, get onto my website, buy the book, all right, the website is think-feel-do.com.au, or mail me directly, if you want me to talk at your school, we can do it via Zoom, uh, internationally, it doesn't matter, you can hit me up at hank, H-A-N-K, at yesicanresilience.com, hank, at yesicanresilience.com, or go and have a look at my website, um, thinkfeeldo.com.au or um, we've just started the Instagram page as well which is um, which is I don't even know what it is it's it's it's, uh, it's <laughs> yes I can underscore resilience I do know what it is yes I can underscore resilience uh, or you can hit us up at thinkfeeldo man I've given you so many places to find me or just shout yes I can in the in the shopping center and then I know you want to talk all right, so I want to challenge everybody. Hey, guys, I've made it easy for you. I've made a workbook. It's so simple. Sit down with your kids, watch the videos, be part of their of their uh, leadership journey. Um, and yeah, let's let's get out there. My my goal, uh, Kev, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. My goal is I want to hit some you know reach a million children. All right, uh, a million teenagers. That's that's what my goal is. I'm I'm redirecting all of our corporate world, you know, corporate life into this. I'm passionate about it. I have teenagers 
and now it's become real for me it's not academic so and you might say well i don't have teenagers but you probably know somebody who does so if you want to buy somebody or give them a book by all means get hold of me let's change the world together come on people who's with me beautiful with beautiful me? gift uh, i will certainly sign up i have uh, nephews and a niece who are who will very shortly be coming into these teenage years and i think it'd be a really great thing for them to do so uh, i think i know what the next birthday present or christmas present will be so, thank you so we've got that sorted so, uh, thank you Jeff. okay cool and all of the the uh, links that hank mentioned there will be in the show notes wherever you're listening to this uh, just check down in, in the notes there and you'll be able to click on and go on through to those uh, hank thank you so much again for your time we really appreciate having you on the show